on in the programme. My next guest made her name in the toughest job in journalism, covering wars. In television, it was a man's job until she came along and proved she could mix it with the best of them. She tells her life story in her book, The Kindness of Strangers, a fascinating account of a remarkable woman. Ladies and gentlemen, Kate Adie. <laughs> So, strong men quake as she approaches. It is said of you that when the army see you coming, they know it's going to get tough. The war's about to start. Is that true? Oh, no. I hope not. I hope not. And I don't quite know how it happened, um, because I never, ever thought I'd go into those situations, ever. Well, it's interesting, because in your book you paint the picture of yourself as a child growing up in Sunderland, and you say you're shy, you're hard of hearing, and you hated asking questions. So how <laughs> do you get the job that you've got? <laughs> Big mistake in a way. Well, I had a degree from university in Swedish and ancient Icelandic. That'd be useful. Uh, yeah, well, got a bit tough down the job centre. <laughs> and I was interested in doing anything really that took me a little bit out and further from my hometown. I was nosy, I was curious. And I'd done a radio programme in my final year at University of Newcastle. Um, and it was a quiz programme. I sank my team on the last question, so I really couldn't appear on the campus for a long time. <laughs> but I thought, all of those people who'd been involved in the radio programme, the BBC, they seemed to have a great job. I mean, this was work. <laughs> I was fascinated by it, and I was hooked from that point on. But do you still think when you're standing in a war zone with bullets exploding around you and tanks firing that... Uh, this is a job, I mean, that you wanted? It's, it has its grimmer moments. It does have a darker side. But I think a lot of people assume that the whole thing is a grim and uh, extraordinarily depressive task. I approach it from the point of view of the world is interesting. It's full of interesting people. It's full of people to meet, um, things to see. And the job of a reporter gives you the chance to poke your nose in and say, look, this is really interesting. Can I, can I find out more about it? And I've always wanted to do that. And war is just the same. There's so much to see, so many stories to hear from people, so much to say, I didn't know that happened. More people ought to know about that. Do, but do, do you think that you bring, because you are a woman, do you think you bring a different eye to war? By that I mean that most men grow up as boys. They, they're given guns to play with. They understand about war. There's that macho pride that, that, that they have. Um, they were did national service up until, you know, some 50s, 60s. Uh, therefore, committed to the army life and the idea of soldiers. Now, women are not like that at all. They're not. And I wonder if you, if you felt that you did approach it differently. I started off when I was very junior, not as a reporter, but a producer in local radio, um, stating rather firmly, I didn't think there was any difference in how you approach the job. I'm not so sure now, because I think that having spent a lot of time in places like Bosnia, with the war right around you, and no escape from it, and seeing how people in their intimate daily lives are affected in every way. This is not just the soldiers on the front line, the guys going off to the trenches with the guns. You notice uh, extraordinary things happen to people who want none of the fighting, who have no part in it, who are not asked about it, and who are no part of the process. They just end up being affected by war. I can remember an extraordinary moment in Sarajevo, going to see this woman. Um, over, I can't remember why we'd gone to see her, but we knocked at the door, pushed the door open, went up onto the second floor of a block of flats in the middle of Sarajevo, which was very badly damaged by shell fire. And a very excited little girl ran towards us and said, the electricity's on today, electricity's on. And this was quite a moment because the power stations were nearly all gone and it was very rarely power. And she said, mommy's, you know, busy. And we went into this room and there was this woman hoovering. Well, there was nothing odd about that, except that the room had no walls. <laughs> and all the dust and muck of the streets was in. But she was going to keep up appearances. Mm. She was not going to have her life mm. affected. Mm. This was war, but it could stay at mm. arm's length. Mm. That sort of thing absolutely riveting. Well, that's very moving also. It's very telling, isn't it? Yes. How people cope with, with extreme situations. I'm absolutely fascinated by this. Not in a ghoulish way, because it gives me some idea that people get through things. 
Yes. I just wonderful yes. to see what people do. You, you made the point too in the book, interestingly, that, that it's not the, 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 the big momentous battles, it's not uh, the tank warfare and that sort of thing that, that you find most affecting to you personally. It's the small incidental things that happen around you that, that you find the most difficult to deal with. Usually, yes. Could you explain? There, there are, I mean, an when you see warfare, you know, at full blast, it's awesome. If you're on the deck of one of those great Nimitz aircraft carriers, the American ones, and you have the catapults, huge, great steam catapults, thrusting these fighter planes and the bombers off the uh, decks, and there's all the bombs and missiles piled up, you can't hear to think. It's all a darkness, it's flashing lights, it's smell, it's everything. It's awesome stuff. It's terrifying. And so is tank fire. You, you, the very middle of you, you know, just quakes. It's truly fearsome, fearful stuff. And yet, for all of that, I mean, the things I retain, I'm going back to Bosnia, um, walking into a village one day which had been ethnically cleansed, people chased out. Often there was only the old people left. I remember a little old lady waddling up the road towards us, trying to tell us something. And we finally, through an interpreter, understood that her family had been missing for a year. She hadn't seen any of her family. Um, but she was pointing to what was really the problem. All she'd had left was her cow. She was pointing behind us, and we passed a dead cow on the road. And she waddled past us, and she was very arthritic. And she got down by the side of the road and just patted the cow. Mm. That's all she had, and it was gone. I mean, I don't forget things like that. Um, and that shows me, at least, what happens during war. Mm. Mm. And Northern Ireland, too, the, the Christmas tree oh, story. Was, I, uh, I was particularly moved by that. Um, yeah, well, we went, we went off one night, as was so common, you know, just a, a quick phone call had come in from someone, uh, maybe a neighbor, where there'd been an incident in a rather <coughs> derelict road with a lot of people um, moved out and rather empty houses, but one or two people still there. Got there very fast. Got there before, in fact, most of the emergency people and security people turned up. And being naive, I went straight into this house. The light was on, little Edwardian house, um, front room, just before Christmas. And there'd been a shooting. I went straight into the front room. There was a little boy standing there. And he said, me daddy, me daddy. And he pointed, and on the floor was his father, lying dead under the Christmas tree. Um, I'd never felt more inadequate in my life. I mean, you're a reporter. This is really at the core of being a reporter. What are you there for? You know, mm. there's very mm. little you can do. Mm. Mm. And you don't know him. He doesn't look to you particularly for comfort. I managed to grab a couple of neighbors who are on the doorstep and sort of get them, mm. say, take him out. You're a reporter. What can you do about that? So you can remember it. You can report it as straightforwardly as you can without the sentiment. It's just a terrible, another incident. But they do stay with you, those things. But you see, now, g given all that, and, 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 and it, it argues the question, the obvious question, why do you put yourself through it? I mean, was there, was there in, the, in your life, well, I know the answer to this one, there was. There was a moment, I mean, you, you describe the book very movingly about how you came to have a, a sense of injustice, and it happened mm. when you were a young person. Mm. 